Okay. We're in Luke, the 12th chapter, and um, I want to talk about a man that was called a fool. In Luke 12, verse 16, Jesus spake a parable. The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall these things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. As we begin this, he's getting a point across about covetousness. He's getting a point across about materialism. I believe that we live in a world in which, well, it's a material world. There's things you and I require, aren't they? We, we, we require shelter. I'd sure hate to go through a winter here in Texas without having a nice warm house to stay in. Also, we require food. That's a necessity. You go without food, and you're going to know it. You're going to be hungry. You're going to desire that food. You require water. Matter of fact, you require that more than you require food. We require clothing. Clothing not only protects us whenever we go out, but it provides that modesty that we need. Proper clothing is so important to us. And so we can become caught up in these things. The rich man, we admire the man who has the, the house on the hill, with the, as the song says, with the crystal chandelier. And yet, as the song says, it can't make you happy. That's not what's going to satisfy you. Matter of fact, I saw a deal on celebrities recently. And some of the celebrities were talking. They say, wealth does not make you happy. And they should know the ones who were talking because they were very wealthy people. Many of them have become philanthropists in the hope of finding some fulfillment in that. Here we have a man who's a good businessman. No question about that. He's a man that is rich in the first place. He's been able to build up his wealth. He has fields, and he's, he's planted those fields, and apparently he planted them with wisdom. But not only that, but God has blessed him. You'll remember that Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that God causes it to rain on both the just and the unjust. Well, this man's going to be an unjust man. We're going to see that. But God blessed him with the temporal things anyway, didn't he? And so it brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. Don't you know that people all over the world, if they were looking at that man and seeing his problem, wish they had the same problem? <laughs> I just wish I... I had to worry about where I was going to put all my goods, you know, all my fruits and all my profit. What could I do with these things? But this man had many goods, much, pro, pro, much productivity. And what am I going to do about this? I don't have enough room to store it all. Reminds me of old Jack Benny, you know. Ever watch the Jack Benny show? Oh, he'd go down, way down into the basement. He had an alligator guarding his, uh, his vault. And he'd go into that vault where he could count his money. I don't think he hardly ever took any out. But he'd go down there and he'd count it and it'd accumulate. And I understand it really wasn't like that. But that's what he portrayed in his movies and TV shows. And so we see someone who reminds us of that. I'm going to store all of my goods. I'm going to keep it. And I'm going to be able to live off of these goods from now on, you say. Don't we all want financial security? 
Don't we all think about the time we're going to be retiring? What are we going to do if all we have is Social Security? I believe it. We've got a big raise this year, or this coming year. I believe it's going to amount to maybe a couple of dollars for some of us. <laughs> so we get big raises every so often. I think part of the problem is Congress stole it from us and spent it. But uh, this man, he don't have to worry about that. He thinks. How many people have lost their money? I remember back in the 70s, we had money, $500 in savings and loan, earning about 15%. Can you imagine that now? Do good to get 2% anymore, don't you? It was earning 15%. We'd buy a, a case of beans to sell at the grocery store, and by the time we sold them, the price had gone up so much that we used all of our, had to use all the profit to buy the next case of beans to sell. You couldn't make much money that way, not really. And so a president did come who got that under control and took care of it, and in doing so, he made a lot of enemies. But he put a stop to it. This man, oh, he was all right. He had it made, he thought. I've got, I've got so much. I'm going to have to do this. I'm going to build, tear down my old barns. I'm going to build greater barns. And there will I bestow my fruits and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be. Hey, my social security problems are taken care of. I've got enough to last me. I can live off of this. But I started to say about the S and L's. I remember when it crashed. I remember what happened. Retirement couple after retirement couple who'd put their money in that high interest savings and loans because they're giving more than the banks lost everything they had because the insurance went out. Used it all up. Couldn't pay for it. Couldn't reimburse everybody. And so it was gone. I remember watching, a, we was living in northern Oklahoma at the time, and I remember watching a couple from Kansas, a retired couple. They didn't know what they was going to do. Their Social Security wouldn't take care of everything. And all that money, gone. Just as though it was in a fire, just like the wind. We have a tendency, because we live in this material world, to think that we can put money up here, money up there, make investments, and somehow we have an assurance of tomorrow. We're just like this man right here. Friend, that money can be gone in an instant. It happened in the 1920s, late 20s. It happened for many during the, during the 70s, early 80s. I don't remember just when it was. I believe it's early 80s. No, it must have been the 70s because we was in Deer Creek. Uh, and it happened. It happens all the time to people. They think they're secure. They think they've got it made. And then it's gone. I've heard of rich people who had money managers and their money manager stole from them until they did this in trouble financially. We have no assurance. No matter how secure we think we are, we don't have that assurance. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't save. That doesn't mean we shouldn't put up because we should. But the point is, we can't put our confidence in that. That's where we make our mistake. Nothing wrong with putting money aside. The Lord teaches us to use wisdom in the things of this world, in the money matters. But the problem comes when we start putting our trust in these kind of things. Much goods. Got it made. Eat, drink, and be merry. Verse 20, But God said to him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall these things be which thou hast provided? We're all going to leave this life. We may leave something for somebody else. We may not. I've told my kids, I'm not leaving anything. <laughs> it 
Maybe you can sell the house and get something. <laughs> I'm not leaving anything. I'm going to use it. I'm going to enjoy it if I can, or I may lose it. But I'm going to do the best I can. I have full confidence in Jerry and Sonia. And if I had anything when I die, they would use it wisely. But things change sometimes, and people change. I've seen money left to kids who've never had money. Now, they have, and they know how to manage it. Don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. I've seen people who've not had money come into money, and do you know what happens many, much of the time? You know what happens? You do, don't you, Delbert? They never had it to manage it, and so it goes, doesn't it? And sometimes easy come, easy go. Sometimes easy come, hard go. I believe I told you about visiting with a man from Tyler, Texas. A few years back, they had this contest on home and gardens. I think they do it every year. Million dollar house. They built it out on the lake there at Tyler. Beautiful home. Well, I knew somebody what it, and I asked someone from Tyler whenever I met someone from Tyler. I said, do you know anything about the home and gardens house, the guy who got it? How's he doing? Oh, he don't have it anymore. He had it for a year. When taxes came due, he couldn't pay him, lost everything he had. <laughs> he was probably better off before he got the house than he was afterward. I see people come up on, and I enjoy the show. Don't misunderstand. The price is right. And they will win anywhere from 20000 to maybe even up to 80 some odd thousand dollars on that show. And I can't help but to think, what's going to happen when the tax man comes up? <laughs> Many people have to sell all that. So happy to get it, then it goes. And you know what happens the first time they drive that car too, don't you? Down it goes in value. Very first trip off the lot. The point I'm trying to make is this. We think we have these things. We think we have it made, and we could lose it all in an instant. Now sometimes there's people I admire. I remember when we lived... At Savoy, there's a man on television. There'd been a fire, burned up everything he had, house and everything. He said, well, I didn't have anything when I started. I'd just start over again. <laughs> I don't know if I'd have that kind of courage or not, especially, you know, as we get older, we don't have as much time to build it up again, do we? But he had the right kind of attitude, I think, and that's the kind of attitude we have to have. But friends, we could die. And that's the thing. Listen to what God says. Thou fool. Why is he a fool? Because he was looking ahead and he was assuring himself he had this security. Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Whatever we may leave for an inheritance might be used wisely, it might not. I've seen money given to good causes that went bad. I've seen money given to good works that went bad. I've seen houses donated, lands donated to works that lost their way. They were good when the people made those donations, when the people willed it to those works. And then later on, they apostatize and they change. We have no assurance of how our money will be used after we're gone. Who shall these things be? Well, they're not going to be mine. There's an old story, and you all have heard it, I know. About the old boy, he was wealthy. He had, I don't know how many cars, but he had one that was his favorite, and it was a beautiful gold Cadillac. He died. They took him out there, and as they found out, his wife said, well, the one thing he wanted, he wanted to be buried in that Cadillac. So they dug the hole big enough had the funeral, all went out to the graveside. As the crane was lowering 
that Cadillac down with him sitting in the driver's seat. Just like that. A man in the crowd was heard to say, man, that's really living. But hardly. Hardly so. We can't take it with us. There's another story about a man told his wife, and you all have heard this, I know you have. If you, ha- if you have, don't stop me. <laughs> the man who told his wife, now when I die, I want you to put, put all of my money up in the attic so I can get it on my way to heaven. Yeah, you've heard it. I see you smiling. You're already laughing. Don't even need to get to the punchline, do I, Rick? <laughs> And so she puts all the money up there when he passes away. She waits a few days. She goes back up there, and sure enough, there's all that money. And she says, I told him he should have put it in the basement. Point being, we just can't take it with us. And all the living we do here is just for a moment. And these things don't hold up. They don't last. They're going to be gone. We need to keep our treasure, as Jesus said, where? In heaven. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. One more story, then I'm going to bring this to a close, because I believe it illustrates the point pretty well. There's this elderly woman who was a true Christian. She lived just a block or so from the church building. And... This was a time before they had developed the walkers that we see people using, and she had a couple of walking sticks. Age, ravages of time, illness, and rheumatism had taken its toll on her. Her little old body ached, and her legs especially ached. But every Sunday morning and every Sunday night, you'd see her with those two sticks making her way to the church building slowly, painfully. A lot of work. She'd done that for years. One of her friends asked her, how do you do that? I know every step you take, it's hurting you. I've been around you enough to know the pain that you're suffering. How can you do that? And she said, well, dear, my heart gets there first, and I follow after. My little old legs just keep, just go after it. Well, friends, that's kind of how we need to be, putting the Lord first, having our treasure where our heart is, and our heart needs to be with the Lord. If our heart is with the Lord, then these mundane things will take second place, and the Lord will come first. Well, the lesson, church, it's a lesson on covetousness. It's a lesson on not being rich toward God, because he could have used that money to serve the Lord. It's a lesson on the fact that our life is short, And we need to use what we have for the Lord's cause, whether it be time, whether it be funds, whatever else it might be. And it's a lesson on security telling us that we need to put our trust not in the dollars, not in the produce that we might be able to produce, but rather in God. Last point, we need to have our treasure in heaven because the treasure here is not going to help us once we're gone. Messengers, if you're subject to the invitation of Jesus Christ, if you believe that he is the Son of God and you're willing to repent of your sins, if you're willing to confess him before men and be baptized for the remission of sins just as those people on the day of Pentecost was in Acts 2, and then, after being baptized, have those sins washed away, serve the Lord every day of your life. Be like that little old lady. Just keep on serving, regardless of what comes. Putting your heart in heaven. Won't you come to Jesus?
Won't you come now, folks, together we stand while we sing?